Hello again, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Start to Finish 3D Printing with Christie Digital, sponsored by Stratasys. We would like to thank our presenters, Mark Barfoot, who's Managing Director of Hyphen Department at Christie Digital Systems, and Bruce Bradshaw, who leads Stratasys marketing efforts here in the United States, for being here today. I'm Leslie Langnaw, Managing Editor at Design World Magazine, and I will be your moderator. Just a few housekeeping details before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, please use hashtag DWWebinar. This webinar will be available afterwards at our online website, designworldonline.com, and you will be emailed a copy uh, in a day or two. Also, there will be questions and answers after both presenters have had a chance to give their presentation presentations. In the meantime, however, there is a question box on your uh, computer, so feel free to go ahead and ask any questions during the webinar, and they will be asked in the question and answer session. So I'm going to introduce to you our presenters. As Managing Director of Hyphen, Mark is responsible for overseeing Hyphen's day-to-day -day operations. Before taking on this role, he oversaw and expanded Christie's in-house product development capabilities, eventually making Christie Service Center Canada's widest ranging prototyping and environmental center under one roof. This full service center is a vital component of product development for Christie and has been open to the public as Hyphen, which is considered a Christie enterprise. Mark joined Christie in, in the year 2000 taking on roles that focused on the engineering processes and standard pol policy standards for Christie's engineering group. He has a BA S sub C in mechanical engineering from the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, and is a member of the Professional Engineers Ontario group. He is also vice president on the board of the Additive Manufacturing Users Group. Bruce Bradshaw is experienced in product marketing, product management, communication, and messaging, and has helped position Stratasys as the leading 3D printer solution in the additive manufacturing market. He is the author of a number of articles in leading industry publications, such as Desktop Engineering, Product Development, and our own Design World magazine, and is often a featured speaker at events such as SME, PTC Live, Solid Work World, and more. He brings more than 20 years' experience of knowledge and expertise in technology, marketing, and overpositioning for organizations such as Stratasys. So without further ado, I'm going to, we're going to begin the presentation with Mark. So Mark, you can now begin. Okay. Um, so I'm going to walk you through today. Uh, the title is Start to Finish 3D Printing but it's really walking through how Christie has used 3D printing uh, over the last 10 years and now how we've expanded that into this new business venture called Hyphen where we're basically allowing outside people in to use the equipment and services we have. Um, so what, uh, just a little bit of background on Christie. So Christie is a global visual, I, visual technologies company. Uh, it offers a diverse solutions for business, entertainment, and uh, industry. We have over 100,000 projector systems worldwide, and we cover a whole range of products, uh, everywhere from cinema. Uh, if you went to see a digital movie, you most likely saw our projectors. Um, control rooms, things like the um, NASDAQ or AT&T control room and some virtual reality uh, uh, simulation environments. Um, whoops. Uh, we, we do large uh, venue displays, things like projecting onto buildings. Here was for the world prim movie premiere for Rio. Um, this was for the expo in Korea. Again, uh, multiple projectors uh, coming at uh, the image from multiple sides and uh, high brightness, high image quality. Uh, the NASDAQ, as I mentioned before, so this is multiple projectors blended into one uh, seamless display uh, for a control room application such as the NASDAQ. Um, this is a new product for us, uh, which again is another one that we've used additive manufacturing or 3D printing for, uh, which we call microtiles. Uh, essentially, uh, they're individual panels that build together kind of like Lego building blocks and you can make any combination of, discre of uh, display. So here you can see these long banners are actually made up of individual panels 
all tiled together to make a very high resolution uh, display. And that product had some unique aspects where we actually had to prototype it so that uh, we could be able to have access from the front and the rear uh, for any servicing issues. Uh, we do what we call caves with projectors, ceiling, walls, floor. You walk in with 3D glasses and you're completely immersed in the environment. And we do a variety of different simulators, whether it be a flight simulator, a car simulator, or any other kind of training system, uh, where it's usually multiple projectors uh, blended onto a dome or a curved screen, uh, so you have a full peripheral view when you're actually in those uh, type of systems. Um, so over the last 10 years, uh, around 10 years ago, I visited one of our industrial designers, and uh, we saw how they used uh, additive manufacturing or, they, or uh, 3D printing. So they had a Stratasys machine, and, and uh, they were able to take the, their design, build it that night, and test it the next day. And so when I saw how they used it, uh, we brought it back to Christie and sold our management team on it. And then ever since then, we've just been continually expanding that capability and using that to help really shorten our lead time, but also just optimize our products. So our products become better products in the end. Um, we started in 2003 with purchasing a Stratasys FDM Titan machine, uh, very similar to the Fortis line now. And that machine pretty much ran 24 hours, seven days a week for those last 10 years uh, with uh, very little issues with it. Uh, it's been very reliable for us. Um, in uh, March of 2011, we added uh, Object Connex 500. Uh, main thing we wanted for that was the ability to simulate rubber gaskets and grips. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, it prints with multiple materials. It's the only machine in the world that you can print multiple materials all in uh, the same build. So you can print a rubber gasket and a hard part together, or you can do overmolded grips, etc. And then in 2012, uh, we added a Fortis 400. Uh, basically to expand our FDM capability, and we added uh, all the other available materials that Stratasys essentially offers. Uh, in October 2012, uh, Christy finally decided to launch our facility to, to allow outside people in. We've had a lot of our customers asking to use our facility, and we just had no way of offering it. So now Hyphen was launched. It's a division of Christy. And, uh, it's essentially a full service rapid prototyping and environmental testing center. And uh, we have a full team of professionals that can help shorten your lead time. And really, you can build anything that you need to build, whether it be from an engineering aspect, architecture, or just from uh, art and uh, uh, theater kind of aspects. Um, we have a variety of different prototyping services. And uh, we also have conventional manufacturing as well, uh, CNC, CNC lathe, and a lot of post-processing uh, capabilities for the additive technologies. Uh, the two main technologies I'm going to talk about today are uh, FDM, or fused deposition modeling, which is, uh, was the main Stratasys product, and then PolyJet, or Objet, which uh, those of you know, uh, Objet and Stratasys are now merged together. And, um, you know, it's really brought the best of both worlds together because now you can have uh, FDM parts that are more rigid and strong um, combined with the smooth surface finish and uh, rubber properties that you can get with the object. Um, we also have a variety of testing services. So, you know, we really do feel that prototyping is only one aspect. You do need to test your prototype and then prototype it again. And uh, so we have a variety of testing services, whether it be from EMI for checking electrical uh, testing, but also vibration, drop, thermal, sound, uh, tension and compression. Uh, we even have a six-axis motion platform uh, for simulating being on a flight simulator. Um, you know, we take our products and we prototype them build them, uh, test it one day, find out what failed, build it again the next day, and try it again. That's really our philosophy here at Christie. So why did we start down this prototype path? Well, as I said, 10 years ago, we were really looking at ways to build our prototypes earlier. Um, and we wanted to try out the designs early and not end up late in the product design cycle when you're at a PPR stage and find that your design doesn't work or you have a problem. Uh, often we used to have to wait till we had an injection molded part show up and then find out it didn't fit. And then you'd have a whole cycle of uh, tooling changes, et cetera. Uh, those could easily you know, delay a project by months. Um, and you know, getting an injection mold part could easily be 16 weeks or more to get a part in. Now we could prototype it, have a part either later that day or uh, you know, within a week for sure. 
um, we found that we've been able to iterate and optimize our designs. And that's one thing that we try to instill in our engineers, that they take their designs, don't just live with the first design they get, but optimize it. Try it every day and iterate it and see what they can get. Um, we're able to check things like serviceability issues to make sure that our customers are going to be able to service it. Um, we often prototype parts even before we get final parts, so whether it be a circuit board or an optical assembly, uh, we will prototype it in plastic just to check the serviceability and fit, um, knowing that later it'll be switched out to a real part. And quite frankly, when we go to our tooling now, we very rarely have any tooling changes because we know the design is finalized and it's uh, sped up that process for us. So what are the savings that we found? Well, we found uh, a bunch of outside uh, cost savings versus having an internal versus outside. We do save a little bit there. Um, big thing for us is not having to ship product outside or having to receive parts, especially we're up in Canada. Um, we were getting prototype parts before or tests before done out of the US or other uh, countries. And often, no matter what happens, it's always the most critical project that gets held up at the border. Uh, now we've never had to worry about that. Um, we have very, fully, very few tooling changes, as I mentioned, and uh, we just don't lose any market opportunity because of that project delays. Um, Yes, we found our project cycle is shortened, but I would say, if anything, it's actually allowed us in that team, same time frame to optimize our designs, so we don't have as many loopbacks or that later on in the design cycle. Um, and it's allowed us to you know, help improve our scheduling and time and uh, eliminate engineers from going out to, to check out things. They can actually check it out here at our facility. Um, this is just a, a slide that we used way back when we first actually started looking at adding additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Um, you know, if you look at the conventional prototype method, it can take a long time to get all those parts in. You know, it takes a little bit of time to design it and then a lot of time to lead time. You know, if you look at these light gray bars, those are your design times and then your, um, you know, your iteration times that you actually have. And the green is the prototyping. Well, now you can actually look that you can actually, in a very short time, have your first prototype, and then as you evolve, you're going to get those prototypes even faster because the majority of the design work is done up front, and then it uh, uh, transcends into the next product. So in you know, the time of less than the time it would take to get one prototype, we have maybe prototyped it five, six, seven times. So what I wanted to do today was walk you through one of our products. Uh, we have a new division, uh, medical division, and they have a product called the Vein Viewer Flex. And uh, it's a unique product. Uh, what it does is it takes a, an infrared image of your arm, and then it will project out back down where the veins are located. Uh, so it's just like a movie screen, like our other projectors are, but now we're using a patient's skin as that screen. Uh, let's you put in IVs and needles uh, to avoid uh, the multiple sticks that uh, some people have to endure. So uh, we'll walk you through what, how we use uh, this technology for that product. So our goal was to essentially take an existing design and unit um, that you can see there on the left and fit it into a handheld device. Um, this was a, a challenge because there was a lot more parts to fit in in a very small way. And we also had a lot of ergonomic uh, discussions and issues because you wanted this easy for nurses to use. and uh, you know, flexible enough to be used, uh, you know, either in an ambulance, at a you know crash site, or uh, in an ER, or even in a surgical area. So uh, we have a lot of different uh, things we had to enhance in the product. So what we did is we started off with some conceptual modeling, and these pictures, unfortunately, are all um, CAD models. But we actually did prototype all of these as well. I just don't have the prototype pictures around. Um, but essentially, as we started our conceptual modeling, working with uh, industrial designers, um, you can get a bit of an idea when you actually look at it here. But especially this product, where it had to go into people's hands, you really can't beat it actually being in somebody's hands so they can actually see it. And uh, that's what we found by trying it out. We iterated through a bunch of different unique ideas to try and see what we, what we would do. Uh, in the end, we ended up with probably a more simpler design than we had originally thought. Um, but you know, as you start fitting in electronics and everything else you need, there's often design rules that stop you from doing maybe the most innovative uh, industrial design. Um, we use the technology to do design iteration. So we encourage engineers to iterate the design and get the optimum result. Um, part of the way we do that is we actually, at Christie, um, the actual program managers do not pay for any of the prototyping parts. 
um, myself and our department as uh, engineering services actually pays for the parts. That eliminates the any need of a, or issue of a program manager not understanding that in injection molded, you know, final production, it's going to be a, a $10 part, but then it's going to be a $100 part because you're prototyping one of. Um, so that helped uh, eliminate some of those issues, but let us get um, free up that issue where a program manager wasn't willing to sign for it. We just let the engineers uh, optimize it. And it's actually worked very well for us. And you'll see some of the iterations here. Some of them are very minor. It may not actually change a lot, but just by tweaking little things like louvers, handle grips, etc., you can optimize your design um, to be the best you want. Um, one of the things our industrial designer here is using a lot is not just looking at the overall products, but right down to individual details. Uh, these are some examples of some knobs that we've done, and we prototype these all on the object machine. Um, the main thing we like with the object is because of the, dirt, the rubber and hard materials uh, together, you can actually do things where in the end it would be an over-molded part. Uh, you can simulate that. Um, these are knobs to uh, you know, adjust horizontal and vertical direction on some of our projectors. But we tried different variations, different ideas to try and prove out which one works the best, has the best grip, and the easiest for people to actually use. We use the prototyping for presentation models. And really the object is the one that uh, by far uh, outshines anything for doing presentation models. Uh, the unique thing by doing multiple materials, you're able to vary material um, you know, we normally use the Vero White and the Tango Black Plus, and so from that you can get a whole range of different materials. Tango Black Plus being a rubber-like material, and the Vero White being a hard material. By mixing between those materials, you can get different shades of gray or different durometers of rubber. So you can see in this part, you can actually simulate things or identify things that people want to know about um, where you can actually change the color so it's more evident as they actually look at it. It's not full color but it gives you a good uh, finish. And the, the other nice thing with the object is because of the finish properties, you can actually you know, paint it up and it looks like a final product, uh, whether you're taking it to a customer or to a trade show. As I mentioned, we do a lot of testing at our facility. So we do vibration solutions. So we will conduct early on, maybe modal analysis to check uh, an actual frame or um, we may check the entire product. So you can see the entire main viewer here is being tested. Those are object uh, skins that we did and checking out how everything works and that the whole system will work uh, through the vibration cycles that we know it's going to need to meet. Uh, this unit over here is actually using um, uh, Stratasys parts um, or actually I guess we used uh, um, object parts to actually make the uh, masters and then made uh, castings from them so that we could actually try out the um, the parts. In earlier on, we did actually FDM parts to actually uh, simulate the parts well before we even got the, the castings made. Um, but again, you're able to prototype investment cast things very quickly because you can make your master within a few days and then uh, a few days more to get the actual investment casting done. Uh, we do a lot of different thermal solutions. You know, our projectors are high brightness. You know, we've, uh, you're talking, you know, 60,000 lumens, 75,000 lumen projectors. So we have a lot of heat. Uh, you know, this vein viewer product didn't have as many heat issues necessarily, but some of our larger ones do. And this is where we really find the FDM has been beneficial. Um, some of our large projectors uh, use Ultram or PPSF material because it's got the high, high temperature limit, 190 degrees Celsius. So now all of a sudden we can do louvers or parts around our lamps which are hitting those temperatures um, early on and try them out uh, without worrying about the material degrading. Um, we also can you know, run it through a whole series of, of temperature tests to prove out operating tests but also non-operating tests. You know, our projectors um, do cover a wide range of levels. Um, you can imagine, you know, you can have a projector running in Texas in the middle of the summer or you can have, uh, you know, a projector going across uh, the northern part of Canada in the middle of winter. Uh, there's going to be a huge temperature difference that those products are going to actually have to withstand. We also uh, use the prototyping to enhance sound perception. And we do have a sound chamber on site. And the unique thing here is that we're able to check it out. We can try different iterations, try different ways of ducting the air to change the level of the noise. Uh, this is an example uh, of the vein viewer. And you can see it's actually, those are object skins where we've now mixed a clear and a black to get kind of a see-through uh, part that we could uh, have a look at. 
Um, and we've done everywhere sound from sound pressure and sound power measurements. Um, we do find the object probably better for this, mainly because of the smooth surface finish, um, because you're all worried about airflow and trying to make sure it's the smoothest that it will be in the final end. Um, you can do it with FDM, but often you may have to uh, do a slight bit of sanding on those parts. Drop testing. Well, this is uh, one area we've done a lot, and it's a, kind of a funny story about when we first got our, our object machine. Uh, literally, the machine was being installed. The first part we built was these parts in the top uh, right picture here. And uh, you know, the engineers came down, uh, grabbed the parts, and took off. Didn't tell me what I, they were going to do with them. Uh, they'd been used to having our FDM machine. So they took the parts, and what did they do? They dropped them. Well, of course, it shattered, because it was just the pure Vera white that we were using, and it just wasn't able to hold up to that type of testing. However, in the, in the future, we actually tried using the ABS-like material on the object, and it did meet the requirements for the drop. Um, however, FDM, we normally, because we have both technologies, we normally run these type of parts on our FDM. So you can see here, uh, this picture here is, a, is the PCABS FDM part, and we were able to do a lot of the drop tests on that. Um, what was unique with this product for drop testing, because it's a medical device, uh, we did a lot of work on the snap fits that put it together because we need to be able to have it that it would drop, but not open up, um, because that was a requirement from the medical industry. Um, once it goes together, it couldn't come back apart. So uh, we had a lot of iterations to try and uh, make sure that would be the case. Um, field demo testing. You know, Again, you're wanting to take the part out and show customers, or you want to get some pre-feedback from, from your, your uh, clients. Um, really, again, the object is another one that sh it sh excels at this, especially where you've got a mixture of rubber and hard parts mixed together. Um, so this was an earlier version of our uh, vein viewer product and also an accessory that we were, were looking at. Uh, we haven't actually released yet, but uh, kind of a rubber grip that kind of goes over it, uh, you know, kind of like your um, cell phone case to kind of give it an extra level of protection. So we were able to prototype that on the object and see how it would look and, uh, you know, uh, as I had said before, you know, the nice thing with the object, you get the nicest, smoothest surface finish from it. You know, you can, it really is the one that can build the smallest features very well. You know, with four tenths of a thou layers, uh, you get very fine resolution. It's, you know, the, by far uh, can build the thinnest uh, part uh, of all my technologies. Um, and by painting it up, you can actually, you know, get a part that looks like the end product and you can send it out. And we had several parts that we sent out to customers uh, or to nurses to try out. Uh, early on in this design phase. Um, whoops. Uh, we've also used uh, the technology to generate molds. So we've either used the FDM or the object to generate molds. Um, this part on the right, as you'll see, uh, this is actually a mold that was done on the object, but we also on the object made the actual part. Uh, it's a, a vein structure essentially. And in the end, what we did, that was just to prove everything out. But then we actually took this mold, uh, poured in a special uh, uh, plastic material or urethane material um, that had a higher temperature limit and special requirements that we needed. Because what we're essentially trying to do with this was to simulate your actual vein. So we needed a material that actually exactly matched the properties of a vein. Uh, so we were able to actually mold that um, using a small vacuum chamber uh, and pouring the material in and make those parts. And then, uh, you know, we only needed a handful of them. The mold uh, lasts for multiple, multiple sections, uh, or multiple parts um, uh, without a problem. Uh, the nice thing with the object is very little finishing of the mold. So if you have some other technologies, uh, FDM is a good example, where you can use it, but you may have to do a lot of hand sanding if you care about the surface finish of your actual part. Um, so this, you know, this part that we're doing, uh, you know, a good example of it, where we are able to make a mold, make a sample part, and then we actually encapsulate that part in another um, uh, resin that actually simulates your skin. So now all of a sudden we have a demo piece that we can actually use with our vein viewer to try out uh, some some of the technologies that we have. Um, we have also, you know. We haven't actually done it yet, but I know you others have, and I've talked to several people that have actually used the object or the FDM to make an injection mold. Uh, it's only good for 20 to 40 shots, but in a lot of cases, that may be enough, especially to give you the um, idea of how your final molds will be, uh, or at least uh, give you the material properties of what your final mold would be. 
Another area that we use uh, additive manufacturing is for our jigs and fixtures. Um, if you come to our lab or any of our uh, engineering labs, you'll see a ton of parts that are made on our additive technology. Um, you know, simple parts that maybe in the past might have been machined um, at a lot longer time and, uh, and cost, now we just prototype. So this example here is actually a flex arm that we use for the vein viewer product. And we had to put it through some life tests. So it actually had to be able to be flexed up over an arc. So we use the object to get the nice smooth surface finish and have it flex through that arc um, multiple cycles to uh, prove out the design. Yes, we could have done it with another method, but this was uh, quick and easy for us to do. We have done a lot of other custom interfaces to measurement equipment. Uh, we have everywhere from airflow meters um, to, to other you know, dust meters, et cetera, where you know, the, the exhaust or input to that device doesn't match your actual product. Well, in the past, you used to use a lot of cardboard and, and duct tape and try to come up with something. Now we just prototype a part and have it built. So now you get a nice smooth transition uh, that you couldn't even do with uh, what you were using before. Um, and you can do it fairly quickly and easily. Uh, we've even used it for making things like holders to hold uh, thermocouple uh, boxes for our thermal chambers. Uh, now we can make a customized box that before you'd be limited by either something that was off the shelf or um, collusion something with some sheet metal. Now you can make a nice professional looking box uh, with basically essentially the same amount of time frame uh, for the engineers to put into it. We, have, we also are really starting to use uh, our machines for production fixtures. In the past, we've always used them for some uh, production fixtures, but now with our addition of the Fortis 400 and having the ability to run the ABS ESD material, uh, we are able to use it for a lot more fixtures. So this is an example where we actually made the entire fixture out of the ABS ESD material. And it's a fixture, you can see it. It holds the, our card cage assembly in place while certain things are being assembled to it. Um, so it needed to be ESD uh, sensitive because the boards are actually on it. And uh, you know, we were able to make that in one piece on the um, FDM, uh, well, two pieces. I guess we added this little piece uh, separately uh, in very easy time. No machining time. And uh, basically, it came off in you know, several hours. Um, this is another example where we've actually made these parts here that are holding these heat sinks are all made on the FDM. And this is a unique thing that we're now doing where we'll make these little parts that we maybe used to CNC machine. Yes, they're not that hard of parts. You can see them in C machine them in relatively short time. However, when you're making several of these for a production line or making several carts or, or um, trays that we need for some of our projectors, uh, it can take some time to make those parts off. Now with the uh, FDM machine, we can actually put those on, build a whole a tray of those overnight, join them up to a standard off the shelf uh, uh, base that we can buy with a few, some very minor drilling and tapping uh, operations on it and you end up having your final part. So it's really sped up our way of doing our fixtures and allows you to do a lot more than you maybe would have been able to do with your uh, CNC. There's no programming time. Uh, essentially you just take the CAD model of, of the actual part, offset over the surfaces to get your actual finished part, save out the STL, send it to the machine and away we go. The other area that we're looking at is we're really looking at adding some low volume production parts. Uh, this is an area where we have in the past made a few parts here or there um, for custom systems or for our individual projectors. Um, we have you know, not done major parts for our projectors. Um, main thing is, you know, as I would say with the technology now, you know, it, it's great for two areas. Either you have a low volume product where you only need 50 of those products a year or 20 of those products a year, you can make a, a fairly reasonable size part. Uh, if you're making the larger volumes, really I would say anything less than a coffee cup size, uh, that's kind of the type of parts you want to look at. Uh, otherwise it just takes way too long to actually make your parts. Um, but the ability of making a custom part, even combining parts that could be two or three parts merged together in one, um, you can easily do uh, with the FTM technology. Um, we find FDM is probably the best, especially for our industry. Uh, main thing is because FDM uses regular uh, resins, so ABS, PCABS, polycarbonate, Ultim, polyphenol sulfone. Those are exact already UL listed materials. 
Uh, the material is identical. So if you're trying to get any of your UL certifications or safety certifications, it already meets it. You don't have to go th through any hoops to get that approved. It's already approved. Um, you know, you can just list the, the standard resin as that uh, material. So uh, that's been really beneficial for us. Uh, that's a disadvantage of some of the other prototyping techniques that are out there uh, because the, you, know, you have to actually qualify the material to be able to use it in that application. Um, we, you know, this is an area for Christie that we're really looking at expanding and uh, adding up on some of our higher, our low volume products. Uh, you know, we do have products that we may only build 50 a year, 100 a year. Um, and that may make more sense to actually build it with the FDM than to worry about going to a tooling. Um, in the past, we would have never used tooling. We would have had to machine it. Um, now we, we don't have to worry about doing any of that. And that's uh, really, in a nutshell, uh, what we've been doing with prototyping. Um, and uh, you know, what we found with uh, the additive technologies or 3D printing, um, you maybe hear, have heard me say both those. The big thing that I find, you know, there is a bit of a misnomer out there right now with uh, 3D printing because uh, a lot of the lower end uh, machines are considered 3D printing. There is, a, there is a definitely a difference in quality between those and higher end machines that uh, we typically refer to as additive manufacturing machines. And uh, I think it is a benefit. Christie has found a huge benefit for it. And uh, as we said, we've launched a Hyphen. And really, it's just a creative playground for everybody to commercialize their ideas in. And uh, you know, we really hope that others can uh, catch the bug that we found, uh, where we can build, test, and optimize their designs. Um, we really find that that's a huge benefit um, moving forward. That you know, if you build it today, try it tomorrow, and tweak it again the next day. So um, I hope you uh, learned something today. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> that was an interesting. Uh, webinar about how you use 3D printing. And now we're going to uh, turn the session over to Bruce Bradshaw, who is going to talk for a few minutes about Stratasys. Great. Uh, Leslie, thanks. Mark, again, uh, awesome uh, presentation. Um, really underscores the uh, the benefits of, of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. You guys are using it in, in many different circumstances, and uh, um, you can see where the benefits are. Um, <clears throat> Not sure, uh, Leslie, where my slides are if they're if they're in here or not. Um, hitting. A, hey, Bruce. Yeah. We're having a little technical difficulty. Uh, we're not seeing your slides on our screen. Yep, and I'm I'm not seeing them either. So, uh, let me let me just talk through. I I, I only have uh, five slides for folks. Um, so the real benefit or the real. Uh, addition to, to Mark's presentation I was going to talk about was a little bit about Stratasys as a company. Um, as Mark referenced, the um, two companies, Object and Stratasys, merged um, back in December and uh, now have both FDM technology and what we refer to as our PolyJet technology under one roof. And I just wanted to touch briefly on the two technologies and the visuals that I had in the slide presentation I'll talk to uh, anyway and hopefully folks can get an idea of what I'm referencing. Um, because the two companies have a number of products under one roof, we've actually um, split the products into three different series of products to make it interesting and uh, people to identify where they should go to when they look to a, a Stratasys product to purchase. Um, the first is called the Idea Series, and that's our entry-level machines. Those are what we refer to as our Mojo and Uprint models, so depending on what you're trying to do as a customer, trying to just get into 3D printing, maybe you're not as sophisticated as what Christie Digital is doing, um, or you want to do distributed 3D printing, meaning you're going to put uh, 3D printers in the engineering group um, for early designs without having to go to the model shop or a group like Mark's, you'd be able to use one of these entry-level professional machines um, starting at around $10,000 for a Mojo, and that's our idea series. The next series is called our design series, and that's where, oh, and I see our, my slides may have actually shown up a little bit. Uh, my apologies, folks. This is the slide we're referring to here. Um, the second series is called uh, the design series, and that is where a lot of the object products or the polyjet products that, that uh, Mark was referring to reside. So if you're um, designing products, you need to do uh, simulations of overmolds and the things that Mark had referenced, you'd look to the design series products. And then the last series is called the production series, which is where the majority of the FDM products reside. And again, um, 
clearly based on Mark's presentation, you can see that a lot of what he does on the FDM side of stuff is used in a production environment, whether that's a jigs and fixtures from the manufacturing floor or that's actually used for what we refer to as DDM, direct digital manufacturing products. Those are found in the uh, production series. Um, the next uh, slide, sorry folks, if you can advance. Um, is really just talking about the two different technologies. I know Mark referenced both of them. I'll just talk about them uh, briefly uh, for a second. One is called the PolyJet, and that's the object side of stuff. And Mark referenced the ability to uh, jet two different materials. And with uh, the PolyJet, or the Conix technology as we refer to it, not only can you uh, jet two different materials, but by jetting those two different materials, you can get as many as 14 different mechanical property in the same part. So I would start in the case of um, uh, an example would be a rubber part and a uh, rubber material and a plastic material and I'll blend those two to get 14 different uh, durometers of a particular part. So if I'm Mark and I'm trying to simulate um, a monitor or a, a, a projector that has keys that are one durometer and the feet of that may be a very, very softer durometer and the outside case that is a, a, a very rigid plastic uh, uh, type of performance. I can print all of that all at the same time in one single pass uh, using that with PolyJet. So it's a different technology. The, the, the FDM technology, which is the, the, the core stratasys uh, technology, actually works a little bit differently. It actually is much like a, um, uh, in a very crude way of saying this, it's much like uh, a weed whacker is at home where you have a spool of plastic and you extrude that, uh, that plastic through a head um, that liquefies the plastic and the head moves in the shape of your product. So you end up with uh, the product but it's actually, as Mark referenced, it's the real material at the end of the day that's actually coming out of the FDM technology. Whereas the PolyJet is, is an acrylic-based photopolymer that simulates rubber, simulates ABS, but it gives you very fine details based on the technology. So as you can see, based on just Mark as an example or Christy Digital as an example, there are two technologies that have benefit in different areas and are used in different circumstances under one roof. So there's lots of uh, examples of other companies that have both technologies under one roof and they use them for different circumstances and different tools. Uh, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Um, I, I, Leslie, with that, I'm not going to belabor much more. There's other, some, some other slides I have in here of represents, uh, re represents other companies and other technologies, I'm sorry, other uh, industries that folks may have used, but just based on the, um, uh, the technical difficulties we're having here with slides, I'm going to switch it back to you and go to questions and answers, and hopefully uh, folks have questions more on the product line or how we position our products. They're welcome to uh, either follow up with questions or uh, email me directly after the presentation. Okay, so now we're going to open up the session for questions, but just a reminder, if you have a question that you don't want to have answered within this webinar, feel free to contact either Mark or Bruce via their phone number or their email address as you see on the slide right now. So the first question that has come in, uh, will we have to deal with the same issues, this is for Mark, where you had with shipping from Canada to the U.S. potentially impacting the time required for deliveries. He's wondering if you have ITAR registration. Okay. Um, we don't have ITAR registration yet. Uh, we, we have looked into that, um, but uh, so far we don't have that. Um, you know, there, there could be a potential for uh, delay going across the border, but you know, again, if, we, you know, if you know how to do it, you can do it fairly quickly. You know, there is always that chance when things go across the border. Okay. Another question that has come in is, what is the maximum size that can be printed regardless of the materials? And a follow-up, can fiber reinforced composites be printed? Um, well, the, the maximum size uh, varies depending on the uh, actual technology that you have. Um, I'm just kind of drawing a blank, but I think it's 14 by 16 inch is the object size, and about, and about the same for the FDM. 
Yep, uh, let me help you out with that, Mark. It, and again, as, as Mark just referenced, it depends on the printer that you actually use. We actually have a, uh, a printer called the Object 1000 that allows you to print 40 inches by 32 by 12. So that's our largest print area, and obviously, um, uh, they're, they're a, uh, it's a new product, and obviously, will um, you know the, the automotive sector of the world and, and, uh, and government will look towards those. Um, but the, the printer that Mark actually has is 16 by 20 by 8. And then if you go down all the way to our Mojo printer, our entry-level professional device, that's a 5-inch by 5-inch by 6-inch print area. So it really depends on the printer. And as I said before, there's 21 different printers we have in our portfolio. So depending on your budget and uh, needs, there's kind of a printer that will fit all the different, uh, different uh, needs that, that folks may have. Okay, and the next question that come in is, uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure this one's for, for you, Mark. If you were buying your first machine today, what would it be? Uh, well, I would, the first one I bought was the Stratasys machine, and I think the first one I'd buy again would be the Stratasys machine. Um, we actually just went through this. Uh, one of the universities locally here uh, was looking at adding a new machine, and they came through our facility. Uh, you know, we, we have all the different technologies, and, uh, you know, they were wondering what they should buy, and, you know, I recommend recommended to them to buy the Stratasys. Uh, main reasons were that, uh, number one, it is by far the easiest to run and use. Um, it's uh, very self-explanatory. You can be up to speed and running it, you know, within a day or two. Probably within a, a month, you're, you know, kind of almost fully confident on it. Uh, there's always things you can learn, but uh, for the most part, you can build pretty good parts. And, and the parts that come off of it are fully functional, uh, durable parts. Uh, so unless you need the fine resolution or the multiple durometer, uh, of the object line, I would say the Stratasys uh, is probably the best. Um, however, the object is, is very easy to use as well. It's, I would say it's probably my next recommendation in terms of easy, ease of use, uh, just because it's uh, you know, relatively easy to clean. Uh, it uh, you know, builds part, multiple different parts. Uh, we find it really beneficial, especially on really short builds. Uh, and that's what we often reserve it for almost, is to you know, those builds that are one or two inch high parts, uh, you can build them, you know, in three or four hours, and with the support material that's on the object machine, you basically wash it off with a pressure washer, and you're left with your hard part. Um, with the Stratasys machine, most of the materials are dissolvable supports, which could take up to 24 hours to actually dissolve. So again, even if it built in four to six hours on the Stratasys, you're going to have another uh, 24 hours before it actually cures or cleans the support off. Is there a particular model of Stratasys that you would buy? Uh, I, personally, I would go with the Fortis line. You know, we have the Fortis okay. 400. Um, as I said, the university locally here, they bought the Fortis 360. Uh, really, the difference between some of the Fortis lines are basically a number of uh, spools of canisters you can put in, whether you can have a switch over midstream, uh, and I believe also in uh, actual build size. We have the largest build size. Uh, that's the other thing I'd recommend is if you have the money, the biggest the better because you're always going to find something that... Uh, is one inch bigger than the part of the machine you have. <laughs> okay. Another question that has come in is, what is the approximate breakdown in use between FG, FDM and PolyJet? And do you find that you use one much more than another, and what drives that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I would say for us, uh, personally, we use our FDM a lot. Uh, we, that is probably the one that's run the most of all of our technologies. You know, as I said before, it runs pretty much 24 hours, seven days a week. And the main thing is because we want functional parts, and that gives the, the best functional uh, part, and we don't necessarily care. An engineer here doesn't care if it has a few layer lines or anything like that. They just want to check fit. They want to check uh, look. Um, the object, however, is is very popular with our guys as well, especially if they're caring about the look. So if they're going to something that they're going to send out to a customer uh, or they want to try out the different durometers, we do that as well. But I would say, you know, as I said, it's pretty much 100% running time on the FDM. Objects probably more down at 40 or 50% run time just because, um, you know, we, it might be more if that was the only machine we had because we'd be running the ABS like. But because we strictly use it for rubber type parts, and a lot of those parts are smaller, uh, where the FDM is running larger parts, so it's a longer build time, um, you know, that, that's what we do in our place. Okay. 
Recently, um, a company in Manitoba used 3D printing to create the body of a concept automobile full scale, apparently by joining a bunch of smaller 3D printed pieces together. So this person's question is, how do they end up with a smooth finish by this method for the overall body? Who wants to take that? Um, uh, it's actually yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. It's it's actually easier than you may think. Um, there is third-party packages, software packages that you can use that help split. If you get the STL in one file, uh, you can split it apart, or you can split it apart in your native CAD package as well. Um, the one unique thing with uh, you know the package we use for doing our our splitting apart, it's a, a product called from Materialize. Um, it lets you put in things like dovetail joints or um, you know, lips where you can actually have it level up. Um, you do maybe end up having to do some sort of a, a sanding or finishing at that layer, but uh, you can actually pretty much join things up uh, fairly seamlessly if you've had enough experience with it. Right, and, and, and I'll add to that. As I said before, there, you know, the technology is used in many, many different industries, and as, as this person asked, used quite a bit in the automotive industry, and I know that um, some of the big three automotive manufacturers use it to prototype a dashboard, as an example, and they'll take, um, you know, three different parts that are printed, and and as Mark talked about, dovetail them together to get an actual dashboard and put that, actu you know, in a in a prototype of a vehicle to get what what is exact size shape. And again, as we talked about before, being able to overmold, you could actually simulate a soft touch on a dashboard. That's the complete size of a dashboard, the exact size. So um, it's done quite a bit and, uh, and used um, in many, many different industries. Okay, I think this one might be for you, Bruce. Okay. Aside from FDM and PolyJet, what other technologies are major players in the additive manufacturing industry? Well, you know, the, the, the common one that folks hear about is, is SLA technology. And again, I referenced the, the, you know, the two different printing technologies and how FDM and, and PolyJet differ. SLA is a laser type um, uh, technology where it shines a laser into a vat of resin. And it's been uh, probably the longest technology in the industry uh, for 3D printing. Another one that I think, Mark, you can even talk about it. I think you referenced that you use SLS technology, which is similar in nature. It's using a laser to shine in a powder that actually converts that powder to a plastic. And those are the three, or, I'm sorry, the four primary technologies that are used in the industry. It's either PolyJet, it's an FDM technology, it's, it's SLA or it's an SLS technology. The last one is called, um, it's, it's similar to SLS, it's, it's by uh, uh, Z Corp, which is shining a, uh, it's combining a powder and a binder together, like a glue almost, to get apart. But those are, the, those are the primary technologies in the industry, and there's pluses and minuses to each one of them uh, based on what you're doing. Um, obviously, Stratasys feels like the, the combination of FDM and PolyJet will solve most folks problems um, utilizing uh, 3D printing, but Mark, maybe you can touch on um, yeah. how you use SLS versus the other two technologies, uh, okay. FDM and, and uh, object in your environment. Well, we do have SLS and SLA here, um, and we actually had a Z-Corp, so we have actually had all those. Um, the big difference is we found we got rid of our Z-Corp. Uh, main reason was we wanted functional parts, and um, the way the Z-Corp builds when the parts come out, they're very soft. They're kind of like you're going on an archaeology dig and you're taking uh, unkilned un ceramics out of a, a vat of powder. So if you have very fine features, it just doesn't come out very well. Uh, we were trying to simulate things that are, again, thin wall injection molded or sheet metal parts. It just was a real tedious task to try and do, and then you have to sim uh, um, infiltrate it afterwards. Um, our SLA and SLS, we do use a lot. Um, the main thing that we would say between those two, um, as I said, both Stratasys and Object, they are my top two for ease of use, and um, you're up and running within a few days, and you know, as I said, within a month or two, you're, you're fully proficient almost on it. Um, not so much on the others. The SLA is not too bad, um, still takes a bit of learning curve, especially as things start to go wrong. It's also a lot more expensive uh, to switch out materials. You can't switch materials as easily as you can on the Object or the FDM because you basically have to buy a whole new vat at a fairly high cost. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're pretty much stuck with one or two materials because it's expensive to add different vats. Um, the SLS, uh, biggest advantage with that is it's the fastest. Um, built some pretty good parts, although um, we've had to actually upgrade our machine to get it to, to build really good quality. 
but it's by far the longest uh, learning curve. Uh, I would say it took us three, uh, three years or more uh, to become fully proficient on how to use that technology. So, um, you know, if you're starting out, I would definitely recommend Stratasys or Object. Um, if, uh, if you're you know, looking at uh, something else, maybe the others, but, but uh, you know, in reality, you can do most things with the Object or FTM. Um, you know, the biggest thing that we probably use the SLS for is just for the speed. Um, this one is coming from someone who is a has a product development class at a non-traditional high school, and he would like advice on what sort of machines and software should they look into to give students real-world experience with 3D printing. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you have an opinion. If so, I'll default to you, and then I can follow up if you'd like. Well, I guess if it's again, if it's for schools, I think I would use the same advice I gave the uh, our university locally here too. Is you know the FDM or, or object technology, you know they're they're both relatively easy to use. Um, you know the the Mojo machine that uh, Stratasys has is a great machine. I've heard great reviews on it. Uh, I've seen it run. Um, you know it's uh, you know it's relatively easy to use. There is a lot of those you know lower end machines, do it yourself, build it yourself kind of kits out there. Uh, I have one, uh, but uh, you, know, you can't really compare the part quality to these production machines that uh, Stratasys uh, puts out. Yeah, I, I think well said, Mark. I mean, the, the difference between the entry-level machines and what we're referring to as professional 3D printers, the part that you get and the experience and the teaching that someone's going to get from using uh, a professional 3D printer versus what I'll call the hobbyist machines are night and day. So if you're trying to prepare students for the real world and what they're going to be experiencing uh, in an engineering role or at the university level, they're going to get much more real-world experience, not only using the printer itself, but the part how the part comes out and how it really replicates the end use uh, part that's actually going to be the manufactured part at the end is going to be much more replicated in a professional 3D printer than it's going to be in a hobbyist side of stuff. I don't know if you agree with that, Mark, or not. But, so. Yep, I agree. <laughs> okay, and I think this one is uh, for Mark. Have you made any dies using ABS M30, as in stamping dies? Uh, we've never done any stamping dies. Uh, we have um, done a part where we've actually made a sample part um, for checking out a CMM fixture um, so that that way once the die was ready, uh, we could check the part right immediately instead of having it sit on a machine. Um, but we've actually, you know, never, we don't do a lot of stamping. Most of our sheet metal uh, is more bent sheet metal parts that we do. Okay. And is there a material available to print a chassis that could hold Christie VR projectors, a material that might be as strong as aluminum? Yeah, there is. Um, we're actually in the middle of potentially looking at adding that technology. Uh, it basically, uh, there's, there's several technologies out there from several different companies, but basically it's similar to an SLS technology where you're building with a bed of powder. So you spread out a layer of powder and then a laser or an electron beam solidifies it. Um, you can build with that technology out of aluminum, titanium, stainless steel, uh, tool steel, and a variety of other uh, different materials. So um, it's the technology is out there. Not, not one of Stratasys product lines, but uh, it is out there. Okay. And how about fiber reinforced composites? Can those be 3D printed? Um, yes, they can, um, but uh, unfortunately not at this point with the Stratasys product line. Um, but you can with the uh, the SLS technology. There is a we have, we run a glass fiber. Uh, you can also run a carbon fiber or aluminum filled material as well. Right, okay. and, and just uh, with our technology, Leslie, folks are actually using um, the FDM technology for a carbon fiber layup. So they're actually using the, the the you know the the pattern, if you will, off of an FDM machine for real carbon fiber layup. So people are actually doing what I refer to as prototyping, and we see that a lot in the aftermarket automotive marketplace, mm -hmm. or or in consumer goods where people are using carbon carbon fiber and they're using ours as tools, if you will, for that. <laughs> yeah, and we've, we've done that a lot as well for laying up a mold. Uh, you can make the master on, well, as I said, make a master on the FDM or the object and then lay it up and, and do carbon fiber or any other layup you want. Okay. Now for the polyjet machines with the multi-material printing capabilities, can you use any two materials as the base or does it have to be the Tango Black and Vera White? And there's a follow-up with the Tango Plus or other clear materials are there any post-processing techniques to get the material more transparent and less foggy? 
Yeah. Yep. So um, uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so um, yeah, you can vary. There's actually uh, I don't remember what the number is now. It was was 107. I think it's 120 different combinations you can make with the object machine now, um, or the polyjet machine. Uh, as I said, we normally use Vero White and Tango Black Plus. We also have done Vero Clear with Tango Black Plus. Uh, you can do mix it the Vero White, I think, with a with a high temperature material. Uh, basically, any of the different materials that Object offers, you can pretty much you know mix and match those materials. Um, and I just went blank on the second part of the yeah, question. Yeah, the second part was post processing for Vero oh, Clear. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we've we've found that as well. Um, you know, with the post processing for Vero Clear, um, you can uh, do various things. Uh, we photo bleach a lot of our parts. So essentially, we put it in a thermal chamber uh, with specialized lighting. Uh, and on uh, Stratus's site, there is some uh, tips on how to do that. And uh, you know, you you basically have to photo bleach each side. Um, we also polish it. So yeah, go down the the grits of sandpaper right out to 12,000 grit um, and polish it. Um, you know, really clear parts. Uh, the best to get clear parts we found is the thinner the geometry, the better. Uh, if you get really thick geometry, uh, the UV light uh, just kind of you know makes it uh, go a bit more yellowy than you probably would like. That's an interesting tip. Okay, what is the difference between object versus polyjet? Uh, it's interesting. It's it's. Uh, apologize to folks. It's actually uh, object was the name of the company, um, and we were branded a lot of our products. At, uh, for instance, our desktop products were called uh, the Object 24, the Object 30. Polyjet is actually the technology that's used in all of our products, um, and it's basically taking inkjet print heads and adapting them for. 3D printing, so adding UV light, adding the capabilities to jet uh, resin or uh, acrylic-based resins through the heads to actually allow it to print 3D, uh, you know, 3D uh, printed material. So um, PolyJet is really the technology behind the object liner printers that are now part of Stratasys. Sorry for that confusion, but uh, that's uh, the PolyJet is really the technology behind the printing. Good clear up. Okay, this uh, this also is a question for you, Bruce. Can you use a U-print for small volume production? Absolutely. We have lots of customers that are actually doing that. Um, you know, again, really depends on the part that you want, but the U-print actually prints ABS plastic, and it is real ABS plastic. So if you're actually doing low volume uh, end use parts, there are plenty of people that that use a U-print. Obviously, you need to consider the the print tray size and uh, the volume uh, that you need to do, but plenty of people that are actually doing that today. I like this next question. During the printing process, how are internal movable parts printed so they don't stick to outer shell parts? Are holes required to be designed, for example? Okay. Um, well, basically, you need to have some level of gap between the parts so that you can clean the support material out. So with the, as I mentioned before, with the FDM line, uh, most of the materials you can, it's dissolvable support. So basically you just throw it in a, in a solution and it'll dissolve away those support materials. Because essentially wherever you have an overhang, you need to support it. Um, with the object line, you can do the same thing. It's a little trickier because you actually have to get in there and clean off that support. But you know, often you can just work things back and forth and clean them and uh, get those parts to actually move as one piece. Okay. Let's see, another question that's come in here. Um, this person's current rapid prototyping supplier has a website that allows him to get instant quotes and allows them to use various materials, finish, accuracy, and quality of the parts. Uh, Bruce, do, does Stratasys offer that kind of instant quoting with those variables? Well, we do have a, a, um, a division called Red Eye that is a, um, a service bureau, if you will. And if you go to the Red Eye site, um, they do have lots of tools to allow you to get uh, um, quotes and, and, and different stuff. And, and Mark, I'm, I, I'll pass it over to you also for hyphen. Do you guys offer that, or is that something that you guys will be well, offering as a service? Yeah, we well, we essentially just launched in October, so we have an online quoting system, but uh, it's not. Um, instantaneous at this point uh, that we plan that is in the plans but it's probably you know about a year out before we're going to be at that point we do try to turn around a quote though within a few hours though okay right. and how much more durable are the FDM parts when compared to the polyjet parts 
uh, is it still possible to use polyjet parts as fixtures? That's a, that's a great question, and, and it really depends on the material that you, you use. As Mark referenced before, uh, the polyjet has an ABS-like material. Um, and let me just take a second and explain what that is. Um, it actually utilizes the multi-material printing technology. One of the trade-offs that you have with materials typically is if you have something that's high temperature, it's typically very brittle. If you have something that's very tough, it's not very high temperature. Because we're actually allowing ourselves to print two different base materials, we can take the best of both worlds and actually combine them into one material. And that's what essentially is the uh, the benefit of the ABS material, the ABS-like material that's printed on a polyjet. So if, if you're using an ABS material in, for jigs and fixtures or even molding, it's a very good solution um, uh, for for that environment. However, FDM is, is ideally made for that. That's specifically where we, is a great sweet spot for that. So you can use polyjet parts. I would recommend ABS if we're going to do that. Otherwise, uh, uh, FDM would be the, the technology that I would lean towards. And Mark, I don't know if you have anything you yeah, want to Yeah, I, I would say the same. You know, you might be able to get away with some of the other object materials, depending on how long you need the fixture or that to last. So you know, if you only need it to put together two or three things, the object's probably more than enough. But um, if you need the more strength, yeah, either the ABS-like or the FDM. Okay. And what is the largest plastic injection part you can create, X, Y, and Z inches? Yeah, again, it would probably be off the Object 1000. Again, it would be an ABS part, and it would be 32 inches by 40 inches by 12 inches. Okay. And uh, this one's for Bruce, and it's regarding the finish for FDM. This person has a printed air cylinder prototype, and achieving, he's achieving smooth finish, surface by dipping printed part into a solution for a given time period. Do you have something similar to this? For FDM, I'm confused, Lonnie, sorry, for FDM, for, is that the idea? For, yeah, the finish yeah. on FDM printed parts. Yeah, I mean, Mark may be able to talk about this in the real world as well. I know that there's lots of post-processing applications. It wouldn't be a dipping solution. It would it would be probably more sanding and polishing in order to get that. But Mark, you again, in a real world yep. environment, you may have better answer than yep. I would. <laughs> so there, there's a couple ways you can do that. There is, um, yeah, we, we often sand it. You can even tumble uh, stratasys parts. Uh, they tumble really well if you, depending on the geometry. Um, the other thing you can do, um, stratasys uh, does have a vapor polishing system where you basically dip it into a, a chemical. Uh, it's a very, not the nicest chemical, I guess, but uh, you can get some level of uh, finishing on it. Um, you know, we, we have looked down that path, but um, for any of our needs at this point, we haven't needed to it. But uh, you can dip it into something kind of like a vapor polishing, um, but, uh, you know, it's a little finicky to do. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, it would, I haven't actually tried it. So. Okay, we're just going to take a couple more questions here. Um, this is a follow-up to the stamping die question where, Mark, you said you used a sheet metal. This person wants to know, have you ever created a prototype dies to you on a press break? Uh, we, we have never uh, created it to be used on a, a press break. Um, we have, we, we use it all the time though for fixtures in our CNC's. Um, so, you know, we often have some weird complicated geometry to support. So the nice thing is we can make an exact uh, match. And then uh, that way, then we can you know, exactly match up when we, we put it together. Um, I haven't made, you could make a, a something for a press break, although I'd be concerned a little bit that even the FDM wouldn't be strong enough uh, for what you need to, to do that. Okay. And this question is about joining polyjet parts. Do either of you have any recommendations on a good adhesive? Uh, we normally just use a you know cyanoacrylate. There's several out there. They all seem to work you know relatively well. But uh, that's what we you know essentially a crazy glue uh, works pretty good. Um, that's what we mostly use. Yep, and and I, I would recommend also there's um, there's uh, application notes on our website to talk about um, application uses like that. And if you don't find the answer you're looking for, feel free to give me an e uh, send me an email, and I'll be happy to connect folks with our application group to talk more in depth about those types of things. Okay. I'd like to thank Mark and Bruce very much for a very informative, interesting webinar on how you can take advantage of 3D printing technology, both for prototyping as well as for some small production capabilities. So 
If your question was not answered, feel free to contact Bruce or Mark at the emails that were on the screen earlier. Just a reminder, this webinar will be available at the Design World online website, and it will be emailed to you. If you would like to connect with Design World at any time, we have a Twitter handle of, at Design World. We are on Facebook at for Engineering Exchange. We are at the, on the Design World group for LinkedIn, and we also have Design World video on YouTube. If you want to discuss some of the topics in this com in this webinar, you feel free to go to the engineeringexchange.com where your fellow engineers will be happy to discuss this subject with you. So thank you, Mark and Bruce, again for a highly informative webinar. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.